Over the past decade, multiple analysts have warned us about a looming financial crisis. The stock market is in a bubble. The debt is unsustainable. The dollar is destined to collapse. So they've told us time and time again. And yet none of this has materialized. The stock market has indeed tumbled on several occasions. But it has always managed to recover and set new all-time highs. The national debt is constantly growing, but the public is still willing to fund it by purchasing US treasuries. The dollar is steadily losing value, but it is still the global reserve currency and there are no serious threats to its hegemony. People have grown so complacent that hardly anyone is preparing themselves for an economic downturn. Any talk of an impending recession is met with mockery and disbelief. And yet there is evidence to suggest that the crisis is finally here. What brings me to this conclusion? How will such a crisis affect our lives? Join me as I explore these questions. As I'm writing these words, Donald Trump is celebrating his victory in the US presidential election. Filled with a renewed sense of optimism, his supporters are piling into the stock market, sending the S&P 500 index to new all-time highs. They are certain that under his leadership, the economy will prosper and inflation will become a thing of the past. However, their enthusiasm may be misplaced. There are reasons to believe that the US economy is headed towards a financial crisis, which even Donald Trump cannot prevent. As a matter of fact, it may be closer than most people can imagine. The most reliable indicator for a coming recession is called the yield curve. It is the difference between long-term and short-term treasury yields. Yes, I know it sounds kind of complicated, but trust me, it isn't. Every bond has a yield, which is the interest you earn by holding it. Under normal conditions, bonds with a longer maturity have a higher yield to reflect the increased risk which is associated with holding them. Therefore, the difference between the yield of a 10-year treasury and a 2-year treasury is supposed to be positive. But as you can see from this chart, once in a while this indicator becomes negative. We call this an inverted yield curve. And for some reason, which is not fully understood, it is an extremely reliable indicator of a coming recession. As you can see, since the 1980s, every recession was preceded by a yield curve inversion. In July of 2022, the yield curve has inverted once more, prompting many analysts, including myself, to warn that another recession is coming. But two whole years have passed since then, and the recession is nowhere to be seen. How come? If we look more carefully at the chart, we will notice that the recession doesn't occur immediately after the inversion. There is usually a time lag of up to two years. Also, the recession usually arrives once the inversion is already over, or in other words, when the yield curve uninverts. Well, as we've already mentioned, the current inversion began a little over two years ago, and as of September, it is finally over. Therefore, in all likelihood, we're destined to experience a recession very soon. As a matter of fact, it may have already begun. A recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. 
Since GDP figures are only announced at the end of each quarter, and since they are subject to multiple revisions, we learn that the recession has started only after the fact. Another indicator which I would like you to consider is the rate of unemployment in the US. As you can see, during times of growth, the rate of unemployment tends to gradually decline. It hardly ever grows in a sustained fashion, except right before a recession. Well, the rate of unemployment in the US has bottomed in the first quarter of 2023 and has been inching upward ever since. This gives me yet another reason to suspect that we are entering a recession. Keep in mind that unemployment is a lagging indicator. Corporations do not easily let go of their employees and only do so when faced with a certain crisis. Mass layoffs occur only after a recession was officially declared. The last piece of evidence I have for you is the Fed's funds rate. As you can see from the chart, since the 1980s, interest rate decisions have become far less erratic and far more predictable. Every tightening cycle since then has been followed by a period in which the Fed's funds rate remained constant. But whenever the Fed cut rates for the first time, a recession was not far behind. If you may recall, the Fed stopped raising rates in the summer of 2023 and cut rates by 50 basis points this September. Odds are that this was not just a mid-course correction. In all likelihood, this was the first step in bringing the Fed's funds rate back down to zero and restarting the money printer. Right now, we don't exactly know what will trigger this recession. It could be the collapse of a large financial institution, which sustained heavy losses in the bond market, or in the commercial real estate sector. It could also be the implosion of a large tech company, which will drag the entire stock market down with it. But no matter the official cause, it is important to stress that the repeating cycles of booms and busts in the economy are a direct result of the monetary system under which we live. The fact that we are using fiat currency, which can be conjured out of thin air, instead of real money like gold and silver, allows the central bank to artificially stimulate the economy. By printing trillions of dollars, they can create a false sense of prosperity, which lasts for a couple of years. But then, when their stimulus leads to inflation, they are forced to take the punch bowl away, which quickly leads to a recession. Now that I have your attention, let's talk about the implications of this recession. Mainstream economists would probably tell you this financial crisis will look just like any other we have seen in the past. At first, we may experience a stock market crash, which will hurt everyone's retirement savings. Some companies may go bankrupt. Others will lay off many of their workers. The rate of unemployment will spike, and households will be forced to cut down their expenses. Consumption will slow down, as people are unable to afford anything but the bare necessities. But then, the Federal Reserve will come to the rescue. They will slash interest rates, allowing corporations to borrow more cheaply. They will print enough dollars to bail out any failing institution. According to their version, this will stop the bleeding and allow the economy to recover. Gradually, new jobs will be created, and households will have more money to spend. Eventually, the stock market will find a bottom and begin to rally again. Within a year or two, it will be setting new all-time highs, 
and everything will go back to normal. But this time, mainstream economists will be wrong. I believe that the coming recession will look nothing like the 2008 financial crisis or the dot-com bust. The reason for that is inflation. In the past decades, whenever the Federal Reserve used its power to expand the money supply, the new dollars flowed into assets such as stocks, bonds and real estate. This made the owners of these assets richer compared with the rest of the population, but it did not have a meaningful effect on the prices of consumer goods. Therefore, the cost of living remained pretty much the same. But since the year 2020, everything has changed. The combination of lockdowns, together with stimmy checks, has diverted the flow of dollars from assets to commodities. This has ignited an inflation, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1970s. Right now, the Federal Reserve is under the impression that they've already defeated the inflation. As a matter of fact, they believe that having a recession will annihilate it completely, because a recession is deflationary in nature, and according to the Keynesian theory, inflation and deflation cannot exist at the same time. But that is not the case. A recession can only induce short-term deflation, while inflation is a long-term phenomenon. As the saying goes, once you let the inflation genie out of the bottle, it is very difficult to put it back in. The public, which has already experienced one bout of inflation, is more wary of the implications of money printing. In order to protect themselves from further price increases, they will begin to hoard the products which they normally consume. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the increased demand will drive prices up, leading to even more hoarding. This self-reinforcing phenomenon will get bigger and bigger, regardless of the fact that we will be in the midst of a recession. This is how we get the worst of both worlds, an economic contraction coupled with consumer price inflation. This is also known as stagflation, a term which was coined during the miserable 1970s. Unlike previous financial crises, the Federal Reserve will be powerless to help. If they try to stimulate the economy, they will only exacerbate the inflation, and if they try to fight the inflation, they will make the recession so much worse. Eventually, they will be forced to sit idly by, watching as the ramifications of money printing come back to haunt them. Another huge problem is the national debt. American lawmakers have adopted the weird notion as though they can spend any amount of money and rack up any amount of debt without it having any adverse consequences on the economy. This is simply not true. The higher the debt, the higher the interest payment which the US government needs to pay each and every year. Back when interest rates were close to zero, interest payments were small and did not weigh very heavily on the budget. But now that inflation has erupted, the public is demanding a higher rate of interest in order to purchase U.S. Treasuries. Interest payments have now surpassed a trillion dollars per year, becoming the third largest line item on the budget, after Social Security and Health. On top of that, during a recession, tax revenues tend to fall off a cliff making the deficit much worse. This limits the ability of the federal government to intervene in the case of a recession. Any attempt to stimulate the economy fiscally will increase the debt, which will increase the interest payments, which will make the debt even bigger, so on and so forth. What we get is a debt spiral, which will bankrupt the federal government itself. Mainstream economists would tell you 
that the federal government cannot go bankrupt because the Federal Reserve can always print more dollars, buy the treasuries which no one else wants, and prevent such a default. But we've already established that the Fed is trapped. It cannot print more dollars without driving up the rate of inflation, and so it won't be able to bail out the federal government without risking the total collapse of the dollar. Do you see now why the coming recession will be different from all the previous ones? This time around, both the Federal Reserve and the federal government will not be able to come to the rescue. If they try to bail out the economy anyway, they will lose control over the inflation, leading to a hyperinflation. Now, there are analysts out there who claim that it is impossible for the dollar to collapse. As the global reserve currency, so they say, there is always demand for the dollar overseas, which soaks up the excess dollars and prevents hyperinflation. As evidence, they present the amount of dollar-denominated debt, which is owed by corporations all across the world, and is currently estimated at a whopping $60 trillion. However, I believe that they are wrong. As we've explained earlier, inflation is not only driven by the amount of dollars in circulation, but also by their velocity or the number of times they exchange hands during a certain year. As more and more dollars are diverted away from assets, such as stocks and bonds, and into the commodity sector, I expect the velocity of these dollars to increase, and the prices of these commodities to rise. This will make dollar-denominated debt across the world much easier to pay off, especially in commodity-producing nations. The power which the U.S. currently holds over these nations will evaporate, and all the dollars which were exported over the past century will find their way back home, exacerbating the inflation even further. This is exactly why I am so bullish on precious metals, as the only two commodities which are both valuable, scarce, durable and compact enough to fit into a small safe, gold and silver are the only way for the average person to get a direct exposure to the commodity sector and protect themselves from this tidal wave of inflation. For over a decade, I've been warning that we are destined to see a dramatic increase in their prices. Now, it seems as though this prediction is finally about to come true. But be careful, in the event of a financial crisis, the prices of gold and silver may initially drop due to a decline in industrial demand. Only after the central banks begin to ease monetary policy should we see an increase in investment demand, which will carry their prices to new highs. This at least is what happened during previous recessions. Therefore. I urge you to invest only in physical gold and silver and to avoid any kind of debt or leverage. Holding these metals outright will allow you to endure the price volatility, which is sure to come. Thank you for listening to the Silver Hermit Podcast. If you like this content, please donate in the link which appears in the description below. Please subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends and family. Hit the bell icon to be notified whenever I release a new video. Remember, I am not a licensed financial advisor. This video is intended for general informational purposes only and should not be regarded as investment advice. Before taking any investment decision, please consult with a professional financial advisor who may assess your personal investment objectives and needs.